brightens this up just a little bit. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to my talk. And if you've been here for the past few days, you've probably seen me out on the floor in Rob's free play area working on a lot of his machines. So at my talk last year, I gave a preview of what I would like to talk about this year. And to my surprise, when I looked at the schedule of seminars, I saw this seminar topic listed as solid state repair tips. And I thought to myself, let's see the pointer. I thought to myself, that wasn't the title of the talk I, I was previewing last year. So I'm kind of going to nix that. But before anybody leaves in disappointment, my talk that I previewed was a DIY talk, which is repair and service oriented. It's about not necessarily showing you how to adjust an end of stroke switch, but it's, uh, it's more focused on building test jigs and uh, making things that will make your repairs easier. And once I realized that this was listed as solid state repair tips, I did include some things that I think are valuable for uh, pinball repair. So the first thing I want to say is I don't like working on things inside pinball machines. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's a board, if it's a flipper assembly, whatever it is, I don't like working on it in the machine, as, as little as possible anyways. So I'm always making little test jigs to power things up on the bench. And as we step through here, I'm going to give some examples. Um, but when I'm getting ready to make something to power a component up on the bench, I always find myself asking these three necessary questions. And the first question is, what are the requirements of this thing I'm trying to power up on the bench? Does it need voltages? Does it need some kind of data? Does it need user inputs? Um, and as I step through my examples of, of test jigs and test fixtures, we're going to come back to some of these questions and talk specifically about what they need. And the second thing would be, is it feasible to meet those requirements? A lot of times it won't be. You know, if you're trying to power up a driver board on, a, on, a, on the bench, it's going to require some data. It's going to require more than just a voltage or two. So a lot of times those won't be feasible. But um, a lot of things are feasible to power up on the bench, whether it's a board, whether it's a, a small assembly. And the third thing that I would always consider would be and I know this is going to sound silly when I first say it, but how will you know if this component is working correctly if you're powering it up on the bench? And it sounds silly, but if you think about it, most of these things you're powering up aren't going to have a display connected to them. They're not going to have um, any kind of, well, sometimes they might have some, some status LEDs on there. But it's not really always going to be obvious if you're powering something up on the bench whether it's working or not. So that's another big thing to take into account. So those are my three questions I always find myself having to answer before I try to make anything. Um, oh, I added a lot of these kind of slides along the way. My, my cue cards, so I know what's coming next. So before we get to those examples, I want to talk about what sometimes I would consider to be the heart of my workstation, which would be your power supply. This is going to power a lot of these things on the bench. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about this and share what, I'm going to raise this up just a little bit more. And I wanted to share why I consider this type of power supply to be my uh, preferred one. For starters, 
this is just an arcade power supply. They, I think they even call it a dual nine pin arcade power supply. It's used in a lot of video games. Um, what's, what I like about it, first it has an on off switch. Secondly, it has all of the, the commonly needed voltages, five, 12, minus five, minus 12. The five volts is adjustable. And one of the things I like about it the most is it has the dual nine pin output connectors. So it makes it really easy when you're making your test jigs to plug right into this thing. And this is, like I said, it's the heart of a lot of the test jigs I do build. And even before building any test jigs, you can do a lot just with this, just making harnesses, you know, a harness to power up a Gottlieb System 80 board. Uh, harness to power up a Gottlieb System 1 board. A lot of boards you can power up on the bench. What do we have here? Valley 6803. Several different Williams systems. Now, the problem is when you're powering boards up on the bench with just these uh, simple harnesses and a power supply, you always go back to how do you know if it's working? Some CPUs will have status LEDs on the boards, and they'll give you a good idea if it's booting up, but a lot of times you might be checking switch circuits. You might be checking specific things on the board. You're not going to have displays connected. So this becomes a pretty important question. How will you know if it's working correctly if you're powering up as, as a standalone unit? So I use an oscilloscope. I know most people probably don't have oscilloscopes. I use an oscilloscope, and you can look at, say, for example, the switch strobes. If you're looking at the switch strobes, you'll see these, these switch strobe pulses. You can use a logic meter or a logic probe. I, I suspect anyone that would be serious about pinball repair should have a logic probe and know how to use a logic probe. And you'll see the, the, the lights flashing and you'll hear the beeping. Um, so I always focus on when you're powering a board up, find the connector that has the switch strobes. Monitor those as you're powering the board up. Because if the board is not working, you will, you will basically, you won't have switch strobes. You could look at display data output connectors, and they'll be more like square wave, connect, uh, square wave uh, signals. But you'll see some sort of data, or with your logic probe, you'll see some sort of uh, flickering of the high-low lights. Um, okay, so now I want to get back to some real-world examples of a test fixture. Another cue card for me. So the first one, and I know you're probably going to be thinking when I show these first couple examples, but the first, the first example is a little test jig for powering up Gottlieb pop bumper boards on the bench. I work on a lot of Gottlieb games, and if you're working on Gottlieb pop bumper boards in a game, it's not really easy. They're usually at the bottom of the play field, mounted in a hard-to-reach spot, Hard to work on in a game. Sometimes difficult to even get your meter on in a game. So you're probably thinking, as I show these first couple examples, well, Mike, I don't work on Gottlieb games. I don't want to build a Gottlieb pop bumper board tester. But my goal here is not to get you guys to build what I built. It's to inspire you to think about what kind of things do I work on what kind of things would be much easier to work on outside of the machine, and how can I build something to do that? So before I built this, I thought to myself, okay, what are the requirements of this? If I'm going to power up a pop bumper board on the bench, what do I need? And in this case, it was just you need 5 volts for the, the uh, TTL chips on the, on the board itself, you need 24 volts to power a coil, and you need some sort of a user input to simulate that thumper bumper switch in the game. So the requirements are pretty basic, um, but the power supply I showed you earlier does not have a 24 volt output. So underneath the cardboard cover there, I found a very inexpensive power supply on Amazon. And I thought, you know, that is absolutely perfect. 
It's uh, it has five and it's exclusively five and 24 volt outputs, and the 24 volts is rated a plenty enough to power a coil intermittently. So the feasibility part that took care of it right there. So this is a type of thing. I build these type of things all the time. I probably have dozens of little jigs like this for specific tasks over the years. Some of them I use regularly. Some of them have been packed away for 20 years. So that leads us to the third question. How can you tell if the pop bumper board is working or not? This one's pretty obvious. This one, all you need to do is put some kind of a coil in there, and when you push the button, it's either going to kick like the thumper bumper would in the game, or it's not going to kick. And then you've got it, if it's not working, you have it right in front of you on the bench. Easy peasy to work on. Okay, so this is going to be the parts that I stick in here every now and then to try to fit that solid state repair tips title that was promoted on the schedule. So this is something I come across a lot. And I don't know who does this kind of thing. Probably nobody in this room. But um, I would never do anything like this. I couldn't sleep at night if I did something like this and left it that way. But I'm afraid to say I see it all the time. So I want to talk about different ways to fix this. I'm sure everyone in this room that's worked on pinball machines has come across this. Or done it. Or both. So another thing that I consider to be an absolute must if you're working on pinball machines is a tap and die set. I'm not being hyperbolic. I work on a lot of pinball machines, but I'm not being hyperbolic when I say I use this every single day. If you ever have a screw or a bolt, whether it's putting legs on, whether it's screwing a post into a T-nut, or whether it's putting an end stop on a flipper assembly, if you're screwing a screw in or screwing a bolt in and it doesn't go in just as easily as it did when that thing was new, it's time to get the tap and die set out. Don't wedge a screw in. Don't be the guy that does this. So um, how do you fix this? Well, you could buy a new flipper plate, but um, I don't do that unless the flipper plate's you know, damaged in some other way. You could use the tap and die set. This case is probably going to be, uh, be beyond just a simple tapping the 832 threads and you'll be back in business. This, this won't be that. But one thing you could do, this one might be a good candidate for that because I think these screws are so stripped. A good candidate for, for what I'm about to say is this. You could probably go up a size to 1032 screws. You may not even have to drill the holes any bigger. You could probably just tap this to 1032 screws and be in business. Um, that's one possibility. But another possibility is something I do quite frequently too. And that is brazing nuts on the back of the flipper frames. And this is even better than what the factory plates were. The nuts are thicker than the steel originally used. And it's not difficult. And I've been an electronics technician my whole life. And I was never a welder. I was never a brazer. But it's actually pretty easy. And I'm not going to get into like the fundamentals of how you do it. But it doesn't take much to get started with, with doing things like this. And it's useful for so many things besides just brazing nuts back on flipper assemblies. Um, one thing you want to watch is when you go to Home Depot, when you go to Lowe's to buy your uh, torch, make sure to get the yellow map gas cylinders because the, the blue propane won't be hot enough. So basically you just need some flux and you need some brazing material, the brazing medium. And you can probably watch a YouTube video and get the fundamentals. 
I just kind of figured it out myself. But uh, um, I'll just give a couple quick examples here. There's various assemblies in games where I just see threads stripped all the time, kind of like that flipper frame. So I'm frequently brazing nuts on the back of things, whether it's uh, plates, the backing plates for, for bolting legs on, those get stripped a lot, brazing nuts there. Uh, here's a scoop, a ball scoop that's under the play field that was broken about halfway across. And it's a pretty big assembly. So I didn't want to replace the whole assembly, but I just brazed a, a reinforcement plate on the back of it. Now it's stronger than it was when it was original. There's just so many things you can do with it once you uh, get a little experience with brazing. And I don't know how to weld. That's another thing. So, so brazing is something you can do pretty easily. Okay, so let's move on to another example of a simple test jig. There's a more advanced one coming, but for now, I'm going to focus on a couple simple ones. Um, this one, working on a lot of uh, Williams WPC games and trough opto problems, and not just trough opto problems, but these optos go to some sort of a control board. So working on these controller boards and the trough optos, you know, it's right in my wheelhouse for making a test jig for, to work on them on the bench. So I thought to myself, what are the requirements? How, how would I even think about starting to make a test jig to test all these things together? And all you need is 12 volts for the controller board. And you need harnessing to connect them to the controller board and a way to mount the opto so you can easily take a piece of cardboard and make and break those, those beams. So that's not, uh, that's not so hard. And here's the feasibility part answered right there. A couple quick harnesses. You see the 12 volts leaving the bottom going to that power supply I showed earlier. And this is fully functional. But we get to that third question. How do you tell if it's working? This is another one. Doesn't have a display. Doesn't have any LED status lights on it. So how would you tell if it's working? So in this case, I put some resistors pulled up to 12 volts um, on the switch return outputs of this board. And doing this it's easy to put a voltmeter in those pins coming out of the board at the base of those resistors and watch as you break the beams of the trough optos each associated one will toggle between 0 and 12 volts and you can test this test the whole board as you see there i only have seven resistors and this is a 10 opto controller but i think when i built this i was more focused on testing the seven trough switches than I was the controller necessarily. But there probably should be 10 resistors connected to various places, and it must need two switch strobes, which I think I just probably simulated with a ground in this case. Okay, now let's go to another repair tip. Just like everything in pinball machines, I like working on the components outside of the machine. And in this case, I want to talk about flippers. So flippers are another thing. I like having, now I should have said this in the introduction, but um, I've known Rob Burke for, I don't know, 16 or 18 years, and I've worked on pinball machines for him for a long time. And five years ago, when he started getting serious about opening up pastimes in Ohio, his museum arcade, he had warehouses full of games. A lot of his warehouses had, I'm not kidding when I say hundreds of pinball machines. And he bought a place, he, he bought an old grocery store and started rehabbing it to eventually open up the museum. 
So I've worked on a lot of his games, bringing a lot of them back to life. A lot of his games didn't have boards. A lot of his games were just completely non-functional. So I spent a lot of the past five years working on his games, getting them ready for, for pastimes. And flipper assemblies are something I like to have a set of flipper assemblies ready to go for every system. So I probably have boxes of six different Williams flipper assemblies ready to pop in a game, fully shopped out. Several different Gottlieb systems, several, several different Bally systems. I like to make them modular, modular like this. And if you see a couple, you'll, you'll see a couple interesting things about this flipper assembly. One, it has a connector on it. I don't like soldering wires on flipper lugs in the game. I don't like bunching three wires together and trying to solder them onto a flipper coil in the game. So I make all of our flipper assemblies modular. And whether it's Williams, Bally, some of them have extra switches for an upper flipper. Some of them have extra switches for a lane change. And I have standard pinouts for every one of them. If it's a standard flipper like this, that only has two wires going to it, I'll have a two pin connector with a standard pinout. If it has any of those other things, I have a standard, a standard pinout for that. So every flipper assembly is completely interchangeable with every other one of a given system. So with this Gottlieb flipper assembly, you might be able to see the, the second thing I was talking about when I said you might notice some interesting things about these flipper assemblies. In addition to the connector is when I store them or when I'm working on them on the bench, I don't have a flipper coming up through the bottom holding the assembly together. And in this case, you'll see what I do have, and I'll go to the next slide and you can see more clearly. I have a lot, I have a bucket of these pins that I hold the flipper assemblies together with. You'll have the flipper assembly on your bench upside down, and you need something. If I go back here, you can see these have one of these pins holding them together. So it's really easy to, to do your adjustments, and when you're putting them away, to keep them together, keep them from falling apart. So where do I get these pins? Well, it's pretty obvious. Um, I start with long bolts <laughs> and that, that are not fully threaded and cut them. I try to cut them to one three quarter inches. That's my ideal length. Or if you have the real long ones like that one on the left, you can put a nut on there till it, you know, crank it tight so it never comes off and you can get two, two of these pins out of the one bolt. So now you can see more closely what I was talking about. All right, so now we're going to move on to a more advanced test jig. And this is something that I've been thinking about making, but well, I should say I had been thinking about making because I actually did make it a few years ago. But I'd say maybe 20, 25 years ago, I always thought to myself, you know, I have test jigs for the Williams system, the old Williams systems. I have test jigs, the individual old Bally testers. Um, I have a lot of test jigs. Rob has a lot of test jigs at past times. And um, I always wanted a WPC test fixture. And they're pretty rare. And to tell you the truth, I saw the factory one, and I wasn't crazy about it. And they're pretty rare to begin with. And I thought, you know, I want to build a WPC test fixture one of these, one of these days. So in getting ready for past times to open up, I noticed Rob had, was it a slugfest? What was the other baseball game that Williams made in that era, WPC? Was there another one? Maybe it was a slugfest. He had packed away in his warehouse. And it was beat. The game was beat. It probably wasn't salvageable. I think it may have, might have had water damage. I think it was missing some boards. It wasn't really salvageable. And I thought to myself, 
This is the perfect donor to make a test fixture out of. Um, because when you think about what do you need to make a WPC test fixture? What are the requirements? Well, you need a lot of things. First, you need the transformer. You have to power everything. And there's a lot of harnessing that goes into um, powering up a full set of WPC boards. And I thought this, this slug fest is the perfect donor. So I don't want to show the, f I'm going to jump past the finished product here. And I want to start at uh, when I was just getting ready to, I pulled everything out of that slug fest. I've got a ball of harnesses there. I've got the tray that holds the boards. Um, the transformer, I don't know if you could see it under there. It may not be under there. But this was what um, enabled me to do it. Otherwise, if I didn't have this pile of parts and harnesses, it probably wouldn't have been feasible. But I guess I'll go back a step. This picture isn't a good picture. It makes it look like the test fixture is about four feet deep. But trust me, it's just the perspective on the phone. It's actually, it actually fits on a bench with any other test fixture. But I wanted to step through some of how this came together. That's the board tray. And I've since modified some things. I never really liked the way Williams mounted boards in these systems. So I've improved upon that since probably since any of these pictures were, were taken. But um, I wanted to step through how I did this. And then we'll get back to some repair tips. Well, it started with the wooden frame. And this is right up my alley to make something like this. However, I can't take credit for making this. One of Rob's um, construction guys that was renovating pastimes actually is really good at doing this kind of thing. And um, I gave him my specs and very detailed specs, and he made this for me. So this was when I first took it home to start working on it. We'll come up with a few more pictures here. Out in my driveway. Drilling some holes to get some air ventilation through there. Painted. And as you can see here, it's not actually four feet deep. And the progression, getting the display mounted on the back, getting the harnesses in place. Slugfest did not have a flipper control board. So that's something I, I must have added that, the support for that after these pictures were taken. Because none of these pictures have the flipper board. Oh, that brings me to another thing. Even when you look at the final pictures here, you might be thinking, well, there's nothing plugged into the solenoid output circuits. There's nothing plugged into the switch circuits. How are you going to know if those work? Well, everyone's probably aware there's a company called Siegcraft that makes a lot of well, they make a lamp matrix tester. It's just a block about that big with some harnesses on it. And it's just a block of LEDs, kind of like a matrix of LEDs. As you'll see in the later pictures, I mounted one of those in the corner. But they also have one for switch inputs. And that's what I use for the switch inputs. Uh, when you go into test mode on this test fixture, you can check all your switch circuits with that. But here's the inside. This is a rough inside at the moment. If I have the pointer here. I should have zoomed in on that, but um, when you're in lamp test, you'll see the whole matrix flashing through. So that's part of the how will you know if things are working. Um, 
but I also use seed, the same Seedcraft devices on the Solenoid output circuits. I don't have them in this picture. But um, all along the bottom on the flash, flasher circuits and the Solenoid circuits, I use the uh, Seedcraft units to know how things, if things are working. So this was kind of um, an idea that was 25 years in the dreaming state and then finally got done here in the past couple past couple years and this is something I use all the time I work on a lot of WPC games and once again any any board is easier to work on on the bench much easier than in the game okay now I'm gonna jump back to some more repair tips and the first one I'm going to talk about is, well, let's go to it, ribbon cables. A lot of the newer games have ribbon cables. In fact, at this expo, I found myself working on a Williams Indiana Jones that had a bad ribbon cable. And I brought my small box of uh, ribbon cable making tools and parts and I was able to make a new ribbon cable for it right on the spot in a couple of minutes so this is something that it's not beyond anybody's ability um, why would I do it myself well most of the factory ribbon cables look like this one they don't have any strain relief and I would never do a ribbon cable like this, but even a lot of the aftermarket ones don't have strain relief. The wire just goes right in and it's crimped. I much prefer this type, where the wire loops around. If somebody pulls on it, you're not in, a, you're not in nearly as much danger of having the wires pull out. So this would be number one of why I like doing it myself. Reason number two, I find in, I won't say most cases, but I find in many cases, the ribbon cables in the games that come, or the ones you buy, and the OEM ones, they're a little bit too short. So typically, I find I make them a half an inch to an inch longer. Give them a little bit of slack. They're not taut between the boards. And the third reason, you can have them on demand. You don't have to go to a retailer. You don't have to identify which one you need for which game. And you don't have to wait a week or two for them to arrive. So what do you need to do the ribbon cable yourself? There's a very simple crimp tool. And I just looked this crimp tool up on Amazon. This is the one I use. It's $17 on Amazon. So very affordable. It does a good job. And you'll definitely need one to do ribbon cables if you're, if you're planning on doing it. Secondly, what do you need? You need the ends. So I always keep an assortment of 14 pin, 20 pin, 26 pin, and 34 pin. Uh, if you're doing things other than pinball, you might, you might think about 40 pin or 50 pin if you're in the computers. You might find a few oddballs here and there, but 95 to 98 percent of what you're going to do in a pinball machine is going to be one of these four sizes. And I'm going to give you a couple tips. If you look at the connector, I'm kind of a stickler for you know, getting the right orientation of a connector, having pin one be the right way, having the red wire always on pin one, especially in ribbon cables. So if you look closely at those connectors, you'll see there'll be some sort of an indication of where pin one is. In this case, it's this little triangle here, right there. You'll see that little triangle that denotes pin one. So I would make the red wire always go to pin one. And once you crimp it, oh, you'll need one more thing if you're going to be doing ribbon cables. You'll need some ribbon cable. 
And if you're not going to be doing a lot of ribbon cable making, I would suggest buying 40 pin ribbon cable because it's so versatile. So with a 40 pin ribbon cable, and it's easy to rip, to score with a razor blade, and it just tears right down the ribbon cable. Um, the 40 pins are so versatile because you can tear it and you'll have a 14 and a 26 pin cable. You could tear it in half, you'll have two 20s. Or if you need a 34, you're only wasting six pins. So if you're only gonna buy one, I have a whole set of probably eight different length, eight different pin numbers. But uh, if you're gonna buy one, buy a 40 pin. So the next thing I wanna talk about, and I'm not gonna get into you know how you do this, it's kind of beyond the scope of what I'm doing here. But there's probably a lot of good YouTube videos to show the basics of the actual crimping. And then when you're done, you just snap that cover on and you fold the cable over, snap that cover on, you have instant strain relief. So I would encourage anyone that has ribbon cables in their games to start doing the ribbon cable making yourself. So let's move on to another topic. Pin extractors. Another necessity. Now you probably don't need all of these pin extractors, but these are the ones I use on maybe not a daily basis, but I certainly use them regularly. Um, the first two on the left are the, the standard Molex pins. You probably have to have those. Uh, the next the next couple maybe not so much, but I want to focus on the two on the right because those are homemade pin extractors Those if you're working on Gottlieb connectors are necessities and You can make them yourself easily enough. I start with the real thick spring steel from old switch assemblies and if you grind it down to the proper size it makes repinning these Gottlieb, these corroded Gottlieb connectors, much easier. And I don't have the size of the exact width of that tip, but if you see that little channel there below the pin, it has to fit into that precisely. And when you stick it in far enough, you'll, you'll feel it release the locking tab, and then you can get the pins out easily enough. And then when you're done, you have this shiny new, all the shiny new pins in the connector. So I'm going to move on to the other type of Gottlieb, the single-sided Gottlieb pins, uh, connectors. And if you back, if I back up a few slides here, you'll see these two at the end. Uh, the second one from the right is the one for the standard double-sided connectors and the one on the right is a little skinnier for these type and they go in the same way it's just that little slot is a little narrower on this and I don't I tell you the truth I don't know if they make pin extractors for these Steve Young has these just like this um, I remember pin extractors in the past were always very expensive. I don't know how much they are, but it's so easy to make your own. And I have bought some of these before, not from Steve Young. I'm not gonna say anything bad about Steve Young's pin extractors, but I've bought some in the past and they don't last. You use them for one connector and they're broken. And not to say this, not to say these homemade ones won't break. Um, they will, they'll eventually break, but just grind down what's left and keep going down the line till you need another piece of spring steel. Okay, I'm gonna move on to another tip. And that involves crimping. So, I would say there's two things to keep in mind uh, if you want to become good at crimping. And 
Another, you know, when I showed those pictures of flipper assemblies with the stripped screws, I can't tell you how many times I've come across bad crimping jobs. So I think there's two things you need to know to become good at crimping. And believe me, you will save yourself so much time if you become good at crimping. So much time. Bad crimping almost inevitably leads to intermittent problems. And intermittent problems are such a, such a, they're the nemesis of, uh, of any repairman, whether it's, you know, auto repair, pinball repair, anything. So first is understanding the fundamentals of crimping, uh, how you do it, why you do it. And I'm going to get into a little bit of that. But the second thing would be you need experience at doing it. You can't just watch a YouTube video and think you're going to be doing a good job. So going back to those two things, um, the first one, understanding the fundamentals of crimping. I remember this, um, I'll call it a series of sketches that Molex put together probably decades ago. And I found them, I found the series on Google Images that steps through the fundamentals of crimping. And I've included some of those here with this presentation. So these are the actual uh, Molex sketches. I think, okay, they called it anatomy of a terminal pin. I was thinking it was anatomy of a good crimp. But they kind of stepped through. It was a whole series of different, uh, different sketches showing good crimps versus bad crimps, what to look for. Don't have the pin too far in. Don't have the pin too far out. Uh, don't crimp too hard, but crimp hard enough. Like I said, you can find all these sketches uh, if you look for Molex, probably, what would I say that was called? Molex Anatomy of a Terminal Pin. You can find these on Google Images. And if you just look at some of these, um, you see, you see what, they're sh what they're demonstrating here. And it seems obvious once you see. But if you're just doing the crimping, it may not be obvious. You know? But seeing this is a good start for learning the fundamentals of crimping. OK, this one's don't, don't do this, don't do that. This one isn't necessarily to, to do with uh, crimping, but it's something interesting to mention. Um, when you're pulling pins out, a lot of times these locking tabs will become too closed. But keep in mind when you're taking your razor blade to open them back up, don't open them too far. They'll be too weak and they'll probably break off easily. They'll be too, at too much of an angle. So I want to get through some of these. Oh, I was telling you earlier about uh, bad crimping. I want to give an example of a bad crimp. And I said that bad crimping leads to generally intermittent problems. However, this next one I'm going to show you, I can't believe this one would have ever worked at all. Now, this wasn't done by just some guy that was working on his pinball machine. This was actually an af part of an aftermarket kit of some time, some mod that um, Rob ordered that he asked me to put on one of his machines. And it didn't work. And when I got to the bottom of the problem, <laughs> this was the problem. This crimp was actually, these crimps on this thing were so bad, they, weren't, they didn't even make it to the intermittent stage. So I ask you here, how many violations of the Molex crimping violations can you find here? I bet, there, I bet it's more than one. So I'm going to move on. I'll show the crimpers that I use. 
these crimpers were probably $300 when they were new. I probably found these on eBay for, you know, $60 25 years ago. And they're still my everyday go-to crimpers. They crimp both the insulation and the wire at the same time. And they're actually designed for the kind of pins that uh, you're going to be crimping in pinball repair. So I would advise people to get a good set of crimpers like these. And in a pinch, you can use the standard $15, $20 crimpers that you can get at Home Depot. In a pinch, I use these kind of crimpers for the kind of pins that you see here, the 0.093 inch Molex pins. I would never use these kind of crimpers on the, on the, uh, the tiny 0.100 inch pins that come on many CPU connections. I would never use these on those. I, I've seen people do it and it just leads to problems. They just don't get good connections. They're just not designed for those kind of pins. They do a pretty good job on, uh, on most of the other pins. You do have to crimp it twice. You have to crimp the wire, then you have to crimp the insulation. But I generally don't, wouldn't use this kind of crimper for really anything outside of the most emergency uses. Okay, so this next example isn't so much, um, well, I suppose it's a little bit of an example of, of something to fix, but it's uh, just an example of the types of things that I'm always looking to build a little repair aid for. And that is the Williams System 3 to 7 driver boards. Anyone that's ever had a Williams game from that era has probably seen this or worse. And what I do to fix these, you know, the problem with this circuit was the transistors that they used had such a, uh, the requirement on the base of these transistors, they needed such high voltage and current, they had to have these big current limiting resistors in that circuit and it just led to a lot of heat. But I've converted them all over to Darlington transistors, TIP-125 transistors that you can still get regularly. And they're, 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 they're still cheap, they're still available. Then you can get rid of those big power resistors and go with some tiny 10K ohm resistors there. So just to demonstrate, to kind of get the mindset going of building um, aids for making your repairs easier. I've done so many of these. I've actually made a spacer card for spacing those resistors off the board. And I have a, a, a piece of plastic there for knowing where to bend the legs on those resistors so they're all perfectly aligned and they just slide right in the board. Um, Here's my spacer card when I put them in and I'll slide that card out of there when I'm done. Just, I always have this mindset of whatever repair I'm doing, how can I make this repair easier? If I'm ever gonna work on this again, what can I do to make that next time easier? So I'm always focused on um, those kind of things. So doing, uh, doing this and you, I think I went the wrong way. Doing this, you're going to take this to this. And I think this talk probably ended much earlier than I expected. I probably expected to do much more talking at this, but since I have a little bit of time left, I do have a few more topics I would like to talk about. I should have brought my props because I was going to uh, teach a flipper workshop. And um, I wish I would have brought my props here. How much time do we have left? Oh, there's only 10 minutes left? Seven minutes left. Okay. In that case, now I will thank you all for coming. 
and I won't go into my flipper workshop. I thought we had more time than that left. But if we do have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I need one more because it's been covered. Excuse me, Doc, I'll come back. Or do we have a general item? Can you tell us? I almost hesitate in asking uh, people for questions because I know the people at this expo ask really tough questions. And I'm worried that I might be exposed in having limited knowledge and being able to answer these questions. Well, I'm here. <laughs> On the IDC, um, you want to hold that or? Okay. On the IDC uh, uh, ribbon cables? Yeah. I've had experiences where I bought an aftermarket ribbon cable and it didn't quite fit on the on a header. And my what do you mean it didn't quite fit? It just was seemed like I had to literally physically bend the, the, the pins in order to work. Oh, well, you might have that because when people take the ribbon cables off, mm -hmm. a lot of times they come off. It's difficult to take them off and they'll kind of. You know, yeah, but it was so weird. you have to straighten the pins. Yeah, you know, the pins yeah. were straight. Oh, the pins were straight. They, they came off, but it wouldn't plug in. And I had an aftermarket. Could one. you force it in? Yeah, I could force it in, but it didn't feel as smooth as the original. And I'm wondering, is there a certain size? Well, I let me ask you this: the standard ribbon cables have a, a 0.1 inch spacing. Okay. And that's pretty standard, especially if you bought it from a, you know, a, a pinball source. So I'm wondering if the pins were just making such a good connection that it was forced, you had to force it on. Okay. That would be my first thought. Okay. It just felt like you might have had ones. to force it on. It, that might be a good thing because it might have been making such a good connection okay. with, the, with those new pins. I did want to say another, since you're talking about ribbon cables and if you're going to be making your own, I cut them with scissors. Cut them straight across with scissors and you'll get a nice clean cut. So I, I, did, I did mean to mention that when I was talking about ribbon cables. Uh, the question is if the Bali driver boards from the Bali's from the 78 yeah. through crunch again, so they have a high voltage part for the displays. Yeah. And on the cooling plate is uh, the last transistor for this high voltage. Yeah. And I think it's, not easy to become this transistor. What you do if you must change it's, it? It's not easy to find them? Yeah. Oh, I agree with that. W we actually still have a lot of them left, but you're right. They are, they've been discontinued for a long time. Uh, thankfully, um, as the, the, the gas plasma displays are becoming rarer, you don't need that. Yeah. In a lot of games. If you have a lot of games, you've probably converted some of them to LEDs. Okay. So what you could do is if you have a bad high voltage circuit, I take the high voltage components off the board and mark it, you know, no high voltage. Use it in a game that has LED displays. Take that one out that has a working high voltage and okay. keep that one for the, yeah, because you're, you're, you're not going to find those. You're okay, not gonna find two solutions, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I actually have a fairly good stock, maybe at least a few dozen left, but yeah. No more questions. Oh, there is one more. Two more, maybe. Are there any boards or components from any models or boards that you routinely don't try to repair you just say oh, oh I can think of uh, I can think of a couple there's not too many but a couple would be I I hope there's no Gottlieb fans in here I despise Gottlieb system one power supplies System 80s, I don't mind System 80s. System 80s are durable enough. You hardly ever have to take them apart. System 1s, when you have to work on them and you have to unsolder things before you can even take the board off the mounting plate, I despise those. So I've been upgrading a lot of them. There's a guy here, Brett, with X-Pin. 
he makes a replacement for Gottlieb System 1 power supplies. They, they work fantastic. They're a really good item. In fact, I like all of XPIN's items. But that's one. And secondly, would be on the same game, Gottlieb System 1 CPUs. I don't like aftermarket boards in general. I try to keep all of Rob's games with factory boards, and I've worked on a lot of boards. Rob buys a lot of games. Rob buys a lot of games that don't have boards. Rob has a lot of games in his warehouse that don't have boards. And I go through the scrap heap and repair boards to get those working. I don't like aftermarket boards. Um, you know, when Marcelo gave his talk, was it yesterday or the day before? He talked about restoration, and there's there's kind of a historical value to some, to keeping things as original as possible when possible. But I would say cite those two things: Gottlieb System One power supplies, Gottlieb System One CPUs. They're difficult to work on, and the parts are not really available, so I try to avoid those. But I can't think of really anything else. I thought somebody else had a question over here, but now I don't remember who it was. Maybe it wasn't anybody. Okay. Okay, I think we're going to conclude now because I think the next speaker is probably up very quickly. Oh, thank you.